Good morning and welcome to the November member monthly briefing. I'm Thomas Deere, the Vice President of Sales and Engagement at the Chamber, and I have the privilege of being your host this morning. A big thank you to each of you for joining us today and thank you for your membership. These sessions are designed to provide you, the member, with information, solutions, and connections needed to help keep your businesses thriving. Today, you have joined us in listen-only mode with your microphones and cameras muted. We encourage you to ask questions throughout the program using Zoom's chat box. We have an incredible lineup today, so let's get going. Please welcome Jill Meyer, president of the Cincinnati USA Regional Chamber. Thank you, Thomas. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here for our November briefing. Uh, we are starting this month off with a bang and uh, what an exciting week and, and month so far. And the fun is not over, it is just Thursday. Um, I'm gonna drop a note on that for a minute. For those of you who've been paying attention uh, for months, we at the chamber have been paying attention to council and mayoral races in the city and really a number of races throughout the Southwest Ohio, Northern Kentucky and Southeast Indiana um, areas. In early October, uh, you may have seen that we named our ready to lead list. That was 11 candidates for Cincinnati City Council who our members found here at the chamber. Uh, we're best positioned to lead our, our main city here in a manner that will encourage growth, business opportunity, and economic opportunity really for all who call the Cincinnati region home. And I'm really thrilled to report that of the nine new Cincinnati City Council members who were elected, seven of them were on our ready to lead list. So we're feeling really positive about what's ahead. And here's something fun. Five of our new council members are graduates of our leadership programs. And if you've been through or heard about our leadership programs, you know that is a very good thing for our community when we have council members with that breadth of engagement and knowledge and connection. Um, this new council is energetic if you've paid attention on the trail and we really believe they're poised to lead the city of Cincinnati forward. I can assure you that we are ready to partner with them and to expand on our existing relationships at City Hall and beyond to bring really the best, to continue on the momentum, and to really launch Cincinnati into its future. Uh, speaking of the future, you'll get to hear from him uh, in a, a, a few moments, but you know that the city of Cincinnati will have a new executive over the next four years. Um, Aftab Pirival, who many of you know uh, currently as the clerk of courts, you know was elected, and we are so thrilled that our soon-to-be mayor's first uh, really public engagement uh, will be here this morning with us. And here's a little footnote. Um, you will hear from him later. Hopefully he will share with you that he too is a sea change graduate. Um, hopefully he'll tell you about his experience. It's a really great story. Uh, so more on uh, the future of Cincinnati in a few moments. As normal, I wanna take just a minute or two to share a couple of things that are on our minds and that we would love uh, to be on your minds also. The first is our, our annual, I think I can say it, the, the largest local gathering of uh, community and business leaders to talk about the importance of diversity and inclusion. Our annual Fifth Third Bank Diversity Leadership Symposium uh, is back. We are in person again this year, which is something that we missed last year. Uh, add it to the list. On December the 15th at 8 a.m., please join us at the Duke Energy Convention Center um, as we, we roll back together to continue that important conversation. Uh, you can register now, you can sign up for a table, you can sign up to sponsor, which we would love for you to do. It's really a great event and one little teaser, um, content and speakers will be released in the upcoming days, but I will tell you one, and that is our local best-selling author, Mel Gravely, will be one of our keynote speakers. Uh, so if you haven't yet checked out his book, Dear White Friend, uh, or any of his other business books, you'll want to do that before December the 15th because you're not going to want to miss uh, Mel Gravely. Um, so now on to our program, and I'm going to start with a thank you. We are really excited to thank Bank of America for coming on board to sponsor our November and December monthly, monthly member briefings uh, here this morning in our one next in December. Bank of America, if you've been paying attention, is on the move in the Cincinnati market and we are all the better for it. They are one of our momentum investors here at the chamber and they've been a chamber member for over 20 years. 
So we've greatly appreciated their partnership and we're really looking forward uh, to further partnerships with them and starting right here with uh, these events, bringing you our members more of the information and good stuff that you need to uh, keep your day and your month moving forward. I have the great pleasure uh, to introduce the uh, new president of Bank of America here in the Cincinnati market. Um, I think it might be the first Cincinnati market president, um, Mark Ryan, who many of you may know already. Mark uh, has been with Bank of America, uh, Bank of America's Merrill Lynch for I think the bulk of his career. He has been in Cincinnati since 2016. So you may have encountered Mark in your uh, investment conversations. He's been leading the Merrill Lynch division. Last month, Mark was appointed as the president of Bank of America for the Cincinnati region. And in that role, Mark is responsible for delivering growth to shareholders, clients, and communities. And I'll underscore that last part, that last point because Bank of America a few years ago started really investing in the Cincinnati region in a very intentional and thoughtful um, way. And um, we're so happy for their engagement on that front as well as their business leadership. Uh, pay attention as Mark drives business integration, connecting all of the Bank of America, their capabilities of their eight lines of business to the people and the companies that call the Cincinnati region home. So without further ado, and an, an, another thank you, Mark Ryan, thank you for being with us. Congratulations on your new role and we look forward to working with you. And the mic is now yours. Thanks, Jill. Thank you very much for the warm welcome. We at Bank of America are thrilled to partner with the Chamber and support the monthly member briefings. These programs have been such a valuable platform for Chamber members and the greater Cincinnati business community as they provided timely insights, access, business solutions, and connections during these challenging times. Now I'm excited to introduce Aftab Pureval. Mayor-elect Pureval is the current clerk of courts for Hamilton County and on Tuesday was elected as the next mayor of Cincinnati. Aftab was born and raised in Southwest Ohio. His parents are immigrants who came to this country to create a better opportunity for themselves and their family. He attended public schools before heading to college at The Ohio State University, where he served as student body president. Following college, Aftab went from being a Buckeye to a Bearcat and attended law school at the University of Cincinnati College of Law. At UC, he was an editor of the Law Review and worked in the domestic violence clinic representing women who were victims of violence. Deciding that he wanted to come home and serve his community, Aftab returned to Hamilton County, where he worked as a special assistant U.S. attorney for the Department of Justice. As a federal prosecutor, Aftab worked with the FBI, Secret Service, and other law enforcement agencies to investigate and prosecute felonies involving guns, crimes against children, and white collar crimes. Prior to being elected as clerk of court, Aftab served as in-house counsel at Procter & Gamble, supporting a billion dollar business. He serves on the boards of various community organizations, including Cincinnati Union Bethel and Women's Fund. His experience in business and management has earned him numerous honors and awards, including recognition in the Cincinnati Business Courier's 40 Under 40. On Tuesday night, Aftab won election as Cincinnati's 70th mayor and Cincinnati's first American Pacific Islander mayor. Without further ado, it's my pleasure to welcome the next mayor of Cincinnati, Aftab Pureval. Good morning, Mr. Mayor. Mark, thank you so much for that incredibly warm introduction. Jill, thank you so much for this platform. Uh, all of you watching at home, I'm, I'm genuinely honored by this opportunity. And this is my very first uh, meeting with, uh, with the community. Um, and uh, and I, I, I think that um, suggests how seriously I wanna partner with the Regional Chamber of Commerce and partner with both small and big businesses uh, here in Cincinnati, because you know, as you can imagine, we've got some, some challenges. But before we get to that, I, I wanna say thank you to the, the people of Cincinnati who entrusted me uh, with this awesome opportunity and responsibility. I'm, I'm humbled by it. I'm, I'm so incredibly grateful and I'm so excited to get to work. In fact, the work has already started. Uh, yesterday, met with the transition team, met with Mayor Cranley, uh, set up time to meet with city manager uh, Boggs, 
um, to, to start the transition and, and make sure that Cincinnati doesn't miss a beat in what is a still a challenging time in the middle of this pandemic. And that's 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 a lot of the reason that I that I wanted to run uh, and that I did, in fact, run. But but one thing and, and, and so generous with the introduction, giving my bio, you know, one thing that that maybe this crowd would would like to know is. Uh, in 2008, I graduated from the University of Cincinnati College of Law and, and moved to D.C. to work at a, a very large uh, white collar law firm. Um, but I got homesick and, and I decided to come back home and work for free. I worked for free for the uh, Department of Justice. I was a special assistant U.S. attorney uh, prosecuting white collar crimes and crimes against children. But I actually had an opportunity after a year of doing that to work for a federal judge in, 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 in Miami. Uh, in South Florida for the Southern District of Florida, um, uh, a federal clerkship. Uh, and, and I was seriously considering taking it. Um, but, but I actually decided, I decided to stay in Cincinnati. Uh, and I'm so glad that I did. And a, a big part of the reason why I stayed and made that decision without really having a job, <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't know what I was going to do next, uh, was, was, was twofold. Number one, I saw the, 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 the dynamic growth happening in Cincinnati, the, the early stages of the Renaissance, what was going on at the banks and OTR and economic centers throughout all of our neighborhoods. And, and I, I fell in love with the opportunity to, to play a small part in that. But, but you, you need to have a network, right? You need to have both a professional and a social network, particularly if you're a young professional and I didn't really have one, though I, though I went to law school at the University of Cincinnati and incredibly proud of that, my, my professional and in many ways personal network today is because of the chamber and specifically because of sea change. And sea change in my experience there was the other really big reason why I decided to stay because I had made such strong and personal and deep roots and connections and relationships with folks who are not just lawyers, because you know lawyers tend to hang out with lawyers, but but folks uh, in 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 the medical fields, in finance, small business owners, nonprofits, sea change, and the leadership programs that the Cincinnati Chamber uh, create. You know, not just they're not just professional development, although that's incredibly important. But what I found most compelling and transformative from my experience was the community that they are creating. They are little. They are little labs of community that they're creating that makes Cincinnati stickier. It, it certainly worked for me, uh, and I'm, 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 I'm so looking forward to being in a position at the city to help those programs grow and foster those programs to get more both young professionals and professionals into those pipelines so we can continue to create uh, more opportunities for community. Uh, so so I, I wanted to start there because um, the, one of the biggest reasons I'm here in this chair and here as mayor is because I decided to stay and, and see change was was very impactful for that. You know, the, 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 but, but now that I am mayor uh, or mayor elect, excuse me, um, I, I've been reflecting on, on, on why I ran in the first place because it's, you know, it's a challenging time. Um, the past year and a half has been two years really have, have, have been a struggle. And I, I know that personally, my wife is a doctor with TriHealth. She's a hospitalist at Bethesda North and Good Sam. And every day of this pandemic, she's been treating COVID patients. You know, early on in the pandemic, it was, it was very, very scary for us. We, we have a two-year-old at home. He was, he was then uh, basically a newborn when the pandemic really hit, hit in earnest here locally. And after work, because we didn't quite understand what was going on, my wife would come home and, um, and, and come into the house, go directly to our laundry room, take off her scrubs, put them in the wash, and then go immediately and take a shower before she would come see me and come see her baby boy. Um, and, and, and families all across our region have had a really challenging time. Um, some of us have, have lost our homes, some of us our jobs and businesses. A lot of us have lost loved ones. Uh, that, that's principally why I ran in the first place, to try and provide, use my experience in government um, to provide some, some steadiness. Uh, and, and, and despite those challenges, despite the fact that we've had several indictments on, on council, despite the, the spike in violent crime, despite the pandemic and the 
the economic recession as a result of it. What I've been really struck by after a year of door knocking in all 52 neighborhoods, after a year of over 30 forums and debates, what I've been struck by is just how optimistic and how hopeful people are for the future, despite the incredible challenges that we face. Cincinnati believes that its best days are ahead of it. And, and I believe that in my core. I, I believe that despite the fact that the deck is stacked against us, that's exactly when Cincinnati rises. And, and that's why I ran in the first place. But, but if we are going to recover from this pandemic, if we're gonna grow our city, then it is on all of us, both business leaders from small and big institutions and city leaders, myself and our, our brand new council to work collaboratively in partnership to take on the challenges that we face. And, and I'll just talk briefly about, about four of very specific issues that are part of my vision of creating a city that is on the rise, that is a destination for young and diverse families, that is dense and diverse uh, and well poised to win the next decade. But, but it, it, it all can't happen unless we grow and have the resources necessary to do the big things. So recover economic recovery from this pandemic and growth with racial equity in the center of the frame continues to be my top priority. But I think it's important to speak honestly about the challenges that we face. Some of you may know this, some of you may not, but the way that the pandemic has impacted the way that we work and play, namely the amount of people who are working from home remotely who live outside of the city, despite the fact that their job is in the city, are eligible for a tax refund, which could be devastating to our earnings tax revenue uh, as the city, which contributes to 70% of our basic services. Now, the city management right now has done a very responsible job of setting aside federal uh, recovery dollars to, to fill that deficit hole, but that's one-time money that's gonna help us out for a year or two. If, if, if the pandemic, fundamentally and permanently changes the way that we work and people don't come back in person quickly, then that is a deficit the, the, the city is facing in perpetuity. So, so there's even more of an impetus for the city to grow and grow quickly. The, 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 the work that we all have to do starting right now to recruit remote workers, to, to, to put big bets on the innovation district, to support our small businesses and medium businesses to grow and be magnets for talent. That work is even more important now. And it's even more of a priority for me because of these deficits that we're potentially facing. Now, hopefully, hopefully I'm wrong. And hopefully it's not as challenging as what I'm expecting, but, but, but these, these deficits that we're facing because of the pandemic, with coupled with the, the capital investments that we've been deferring and kicking the can down the road, uh, coupled with the, the pension fund being, you know, uh, not in dire straits, but on, on shaky ground, you know, we've got some big financial decisions uh, to make uh, here in the short and medium term. Uh, and it would, it would be a whole lot easier if the city was growing. And, and in, in order for the city to continue to grow, We've got to get the pandemic under control. People have to feel comfortable and safe working and living and playing in person. Uh, and so that, that, that has to be my, my top priority. But, but you know, one, one, one B, I would say, is, is the violence that we've seen in our streets. The gun violence uh, is unprecedented. Uh, and that's not just me saying it, that's, that's CPD saying it. And, and so it's, 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 it's incredibly important uh, particularly since so many of the victims are children and so many of the perpetrators themselves are children. It's, it's important that law enforcement have the resources necessary to do their job, which in my mind is to prevent violent crime from happening and prosecuting violent crime when it does happen. And we need to make sure, uh, for my time at the U.S. Attorney's Office, I know that the federal government has awesome resources that they can bring to bear when it comes to illegally trafficking of guns and drugs and and in Cincinnati, we, we have a flood of illegal guns on our streets. So it'll be uh, uh, important for us to work collaboratively with ATF, FBI, and DOJ to prevent the importation and to prosecute those who are distributing. Uh, we've got to use, we've got to be reliant on the data that we have to really drill down on, 
on specific strategies for unique neighborhoods and hotspot areas. Uh, it's not a one size fits all approach. We have to be data driven. I, I saw a stat that said 1 point, a 1.5 geographic area of the city contributes to over 40% of its violent crime, 1.5%. This is, this is a narrow geographic area. Uh, we know where these hotspots are. We've gotta be, we've gotta be data driven to come up with strategies, but law enforcement alone can't deal with this. Uh, it all comes back to, uh, to, to poverty. Uh, poverty is the root cause of so many of, the, uh, of, of, this, of these impossible choices that, that children are making. Um, and so it's, it's, it's on all of us as a business community to make sure that we continue to grow, create jobs that, that are, are well paid with good benefits, to create opportunities for families to pick themselves up out of poverty. Uh, number three, you know, the, 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 the issue of affordable housing dominated the primary and continued to be important um, in the general election. The original issue three I was against, I'm glad that it failed, um, but that's not the end of the conversation. Uh, I, I've, I've, I've reviewed and read the chamber's uh, housing plan. Uh, I think the chamber and I are eye to eye on the things that need to happen to create more supply of housing, more market rate, more workforce housing, more affordable and low income housing. Uh, and, and the good news is there are things that we can do that don't cost $50 million a year. Number one, we can, as, as the chamber encourages, encourages us to do, and I agree, we can take a look at our zoning code. So much of our zoning code is from a bygone era that envisions an, uh, a city and neighborhoods from the 1950s. It's holding us back. It's artificially keeping supply low. Uh, it, it, it prohibits multifamily units uh, in, in several of our neighborhoods. It has parking requirements for, for businesses and for homes. Uh, it, is, it is artificially choking off our supply, which is increasing property values artificially and artificially increasing rents. And the second thing that we can do and have to do is review and reform our tax abatement process on the residential side. A, a vast majority of our tax incentives are being concentrated in our wealthiest communities at the expense of communities that are looking to grow like Bond Hill and Price Hill. That doesn't make any sense. Uh, we shouldn't be giving tax breaks to wealthy people to build bigger homes when we need tax breaks in other neighborhoods to build more homes, to build more density, to build more economic activity. Uh, so it, it'll be a priority of mine to review those tax abatement processes and drive more equity uh, into it. And then finally, I wanna continue the momentum that John Cranley has made on environmental policies that will safeguard our city for the future, not just for my two-year-old, but for our grandchildren as well. Incredible progress has been made on the Green Cincinnati Plan. We've got to continue that progress by investing uh, in, uh, in infrastructure that is green, uh, by uh, getting our carbon emissions to neutral by 2030, uh, by creating green new jobs. And finally, it's, it's a dirty city. We continue to have a challenge with dumping, with litter. Uh, we've got to do everything we can as a community uh, to make that a priority, to take pride in, in our city and pick up the trash. Uh, but, but in closing, I just want to say thank you so much for this opportunity to speak, but also to lead. You know, my, 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 my parents uh, met in India uh, in 1978 and uh, got married and decided to, to come to the United States. Uh, they decided to come to Ohio, uh, uh, of all places. My, my brother and I came along a couple of years later. I, I, I can't imagine that my parents thought that, um, that either one of their, their sons would be involved in politics, but I have to believe that they thought it was at least a possibility or could be a reality. Uh, and, 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 and that's why they came to this country, because they believed in the greatness of America before they even understood what it was. And, and two nights ago, they were proven right, because in one generation, my family went from being refugees and immigrants to now mayor-elect to Cincinnati. And, and that story only happens right here. And I'm so grateful for the opportunity. Thank you. Aftab, thank you so much for being with us this morning. Thank you for your comments. Uh, and congratulations to you. Um, what a, what a uh, task you have ahead of you. <laughs> and um, I wanna start there. We have um, a few questions that are starting to roll in, but I want to start with something that I, I haven't stopped thinking about really. Um, you're the 70th mayor 
you will be the 70th mayor of the city of Cincinnati. You will be the first Asian American Pacific Islander mayor. Um, and I'm gonna go right for the, there's something I wanna get to on that, but I wanna start with the personal side, which is where you, you ended. I read that your mom and your brother were with you um, on election night. And I, I would just, I would love for you to share mom's reaction, how mom is feeling about um, this huge opportunity that she never envisioned for her baby boy. You know, I, it was so, my, my father died when I was in law school. So um, unfortunately he, he didn't get to see that. Um, but my mom, you know, my mom uh, pulled me aside and, and, and told me how proud he would have been of me. I, I, I initially got in, interested in politics and, and kind of current events because uh, my dad, you know, as, as immigrants, um, immigrant families have to work very hard. And my dad uh, would wake up at, at 4 a.m. Uh, to go to work and, and go to bed at like, you know, 7, 7.30, very early. Uh, and so with, with all of my, you know, sports and after school activities, <clears throat> didn't, didn't really get a chance to spend very much time with him. But the, the time that we did have was usually spent in front of the TV uh, watching Peter Jennings on ABC for the, uh, for the nightly news. Um, and, and so without really knowing it, he really got me interested in current events and news and politics. The politics segment was always my favorite. Um, you know, I think he would have rather I be a doctor. <laughs> I married a doctor though, so I, I backboard <laughs> that. Um, but uh, she said uh, that he would have been just so incredibly proud and that she was proud of me. And um, it was, uh, it, it, it was a, a nice moment and, and really meaningful to me. That's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. You can only, uh, the rest of us can only imagine the joy. <laughs> Thank you. So the other angle I wanted to go with that question is um, by being an Asian American Pacific Islander mayor, that really puts Cincinnati on a short list of, of cities um, that have such mayors. And I'm wondering, as we look at our work here at the chamber to make sure more and more people and businesses come here to call the Cincinnati area home, what message have we sent to the rest of the world, to talent base, to um, people who may be considering uh, their next move by electing uh -huh. a, an Asian American mayor for the first time? You know, I, I, have, I have really been quite surprised by how much of a national and international news our election has been. Um, you know, obviously yesterday I, I did all no, local outlets, but I also did, uh, did NBC National News, I did Politico, I did wa the Washington Post. Uh, I've got several national outlets here today as well. And, and they all asked me the same thing. How on earth did Cincinnati elect the first Asian American mayor in the Midwest? Particularly when you consider that the AAPI community here in the city, I think is less than 3%. Um, so, so to me, what, what I have been advocating throughout the country and the world, frankly, over the last 48 hours uh, is, is, is exactly what I said on election night, which is that Cincinnati just made a profound statement that no matter what you look like or where you're from or how much money you have, you can come to Cincinnati, work hard and achieve your dreams. The opportunities that we have here for anyone are boundless. And, and particularly as it relates to growth, I want the message to be um, that, that in addition to having these incredible opportunities in the national context, we are very, a very affordable city. We are strategically located, particularly for logistical businesses. Uh, we have the best public school in the state, two incredible research institutions in UC Health and, and Children's Hospital, which by the way, is the third best in the world. Incredible corporate partners like my own home, Procter & Gamble. So we've, we've, got, we've got it going on. Uh, and, 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 and the national outlets that I've spoken to are starting to realize that, and hopefully we can get that message out to the talent. And I, I look forward to partnering with Reddy and the Chamber to, to, to make sure that that brand, that messaging is getting to the right people. Well, I'm awfully glad to hear you say that because I was going to say, hold on to your hat, because we have lots of places <laughs> where we'd like for you to deliver that message. I, I want to jump in with, uh, with some of our questions um, from our participants. In addition to you joining City Hall for the first time, we have a number of new council members who will yep. be also new to City Hall and to elected office. Uh, and the first question comes to us from Ann Sessler, who asks straightforward thoughts on how you will work with the new council. I'm, I'm very excited about the new council. Um, 
you know, no, no matter whether it, they had been Democrats, Republicans, or charter rights, uh, the campaign is over. And uh, people expect us, who, who voted for us, who didn't vote for us, people expect us to deliver results. And that's what we're all laser focused on. I've, I've had a chance to speak with all of the council members elect yesterday. And to a person, they all told me they were ready to get to work. They were ready to deliver results for the people of Cincinnati. Uh, and I take them at their word. And, and you know, unfortunately, we've seen the uh, the the nationalization of of or excuse me, the localization of national politics. We continue to be very divided and, and very partisan, very polarized. It'll be my job and council's job to block out the noise and to make decisions based entirely on what's best for the most people in Cincinnati. And, and that's how I expect to work with them as partners collaboratively with my city manager to execute my vision and their vision about the future. And, 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 and they, all, they all have you know, projects that they are passionate about. I know Mark Jeffries is incredibly passionate about transportation and pedestrian safety. I know that Reggie Harris and Jan Michelle are incredibly passionate about affordable housing. So the good news is I, I think we all are aligned on what the big, what the big issues are facing our community. Obviously, we're not always going to, to, to agree, but at the very least, we, we agree on the priority. Scotty Johnson is a former police officer and incredibly passionate about, about public safety and criminal justice. Um, so I'm, I'm looking forward to empowering them uh, to lead on a set of issues that they feel passionate about and working collaboratively with them again to achieve results. Thank you. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll ask a last question here from uh, Kurt Reiber, who joins us. Um, and he says, our region is in the top five of 76 major met metropolitan areas that are negatively impacted by food insecurity. Yep. And that has been exacerbated by the pandemic, of course. Uh, yep. What are your hopes to address this critical issue? It, 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 it continues to be a real problem here in Cincinnati, despite the fact that so many incredible organizations, Free Store Food Bank, uh, the biggest, and, and, and even some more innovative, smaller operations like La Soup, um, are, are, are working to, to, to address it. I, I've met so many tech startups, in fact. Um, I, I'm forgetting the name of, of the startup, but uh, there's, a, there's an organization similar to Uber uh, where you can, uh, you can pick up discarded food uh, and deliver it. Life Mile Food Rescue. There, that's right. There you go. Uh, Life Mile Food Rescue and deliver it to, um, to communities in need. Um, you know, so, so of course this has to be a, a priority. I, I, I'd look first off to see, are these disparate organizations working together? Are there opportunities for synergies? You know, the biggest authority that the mayor has, it's, it's not, I mean, it's a stronger mayor system, but really my authority is implied and, and, and the biggest authority I have is to convene. Uh, and so as mayor, I'd, I'd look to convene these, these various partners, see where there's overlap, see where there's opportunities for efficiency, and where there's deficits, see where the city can step in and bridge that divide either operationally or, or through finances. You know, fundamentally though, what's contributing to, to a lot of the food insecurity is not just finances, but lack of access. Uh, and so again, it, it's, it's not economically viable for Kroger or Aldi's or, or any of our large uh, supermarket chains to put a supermarket in all 52 of our neighborhoods. Uh, but with the, with, with the innovations in technology, particularly around food delivery, and Free Store Food Bank is already doing this, um, I think the, the, the solution to a lot of these food desert challenges is to, is to not bring the grocery store to the community, but rather to bring the food to the community. And so I'd be looking for partners to find innovative ways to do that. Thank you, uh, Aftab. Very thoughtful answer, and you're right. There's, there's a lot happening and seemingly no solution to end it just yet. Uh, well, that unfortunately brings our time with you to a close, but let me say again, congratulations to you. We are thrilled at the Chamber and really looking forward to partnerships with you moving forward, including a few you just gave me an idea for. Um, <laughs> and again, thank you for giving us the honor of um, addressing the business community for the first time here at our member briefing. We will look forward to more opportunities down the road. And um, again, thank you for your time and all of your energy and your dedication to public service. We look forward to what's ahead. Thank you, Jill. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. Thomas? Mayor-elect Perubel, thank you and congratulations. We're so excited to work with you and see how you write the next chapter. Thank you. 
It's my pleasure to introduce three chamber members who have been making an impact in the community. This morning, you'll hear from Kate Botma, the Ken Anderson Alliance, Roger Babick from Master Provisions, and Lauren Waterbury from Cancer Bridge. First up is Kate Botma, Ken Anderson Alliance. Kate is a proud member of Leadership Class 14, and along with Bengal great Ken Anderson, they formed the Ken Anderson Alliance. Originally, she served as executive director. She now serves as the community liaison. The Ken Anderson Alliance is a community where adults with disability can realize their full potential in a safe, affordable, integrated, and supportive environment. They provide a quality of life that enables adults with dis disabilities to develop and sustain lifelong relationships, independence, and self-esteem while contributing to the larger community. Welcome, Kate. Thank you, Thomas, and the chamber for letting me share about something I'm so passionate about. Hey, Spencer, can we start the slides? We can go next. Who is the Ken Anderson Alliance? Well, we are a nonprofit corp 501c3. We work in three areas, live, work, and engage for adults with developmental disabilities. And that's primarily autism and Down syndrome, though there are some others. Next. Our mission clearly shows our values, safety, acceptance, choice, independence. We want our participants to live their best lives. Okay, next. Okay, our first prong is engage program. Next. Every month they get about 22 choices of where they wanna go, sports events, uh, restaurants, concerts, and they also do volunteering like at the free store food bank. Um, so they give back to the community while decreasing their isolation. And if they need something to do through the day, they can go to our extended day program. Next. Work is our next prong. Um, we believe that those who want to work should be able to work. You can go next. It's part of their independence. So many live in poverty with just uh, SSI. So we have work training that's above um, minimum wage and we want people to be then trained and be out in the community. Next. One, one of our uh, enterprises is O2 Urban Farms where job skills are learned and then hopefully moved out into greenhouses and other places. Next. That's actually my son, Zach, who is 27 and on the autism spectrum. And the reason I know how critical these things are. Next, Just Brew, a sea change group we're excited is working with us on marketing our Just Brew coffee house, serve breakfast and lunch. It's a Plainfield Road by our offices and uh, soon we'll have two more locations. Next, and then live. Let's talk about live and affordable housing. Next, why do we wanna do a live community? Well, we all know about affording affordable housing, but there are lots of other reasons. Um, there are so many adults with disabilities. They're living longer, which means parents like me are really concerned about what's gonna happen to our adult children after they outlive us. Next. So we have the Commons of Springfield and we'll be breaking ground in the beginning of 22. Um, there'll be a network of support. They'll be able to get to their friends. And because of the way it's been set out, so it'll be 131 um, housing units. Some will be two bedrooms, but house 131. Some will be with disabilities. Some will be without disabilities, but through our amphitheater, our community center, our fitness center, our cafe, the greater Springfield uh, Township community will be coming in as ours are also going out. Next. Yes, we also have a multi-use sports fields um, and a, a, actually a metro, the metro stop right there. So next. So and we, we wanna have a beneficial economic impact through jobs, through income tax and property tax and, and new jobs that we will also create within the community. Next. We couldn't do that without many, many partners. Uh, this is a big job, there's a large, a population with developmental disabilities. And we thank all our many partners for working with us. And I will put my uh, email and, and our website in the chat. You can go and have a virtual tour of our community there. 
Thank you, Kate. The Alliance is truly an organization that's a champion for adults with disability. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Next up is Roger Babick. He's the president of Master Provisions. Master Provisions is a Florence, Kentucky-based mission founded in 1994 by Roger. They're a faith-based organization that exists to feed the hungry, clothe the, the poor, and care for at-risk children. They work in partnership with agencies that directly serve people in need, distributing resources to, to them. 95% of all donations to Master Provisions are funneled directly to support their program. Welcome, Roger. Thank you so much. It's amazing to represent our team. We love being part of the Cincinnati Chamber as we begin year two. And our main goal is to take excess resources like high quality food and clothing and get it to, pe get it to people in need through nonprofit partners. We currently have over 230 groups that depend on us as either, either their only source or a primary source of food to help meet some of the food insecurity needs right here in our community. Over 67,000 people every single month get the food that we go pick up every single day. And that's the main focus of our ministry, about 80% of our work. We, we do have some sustainability projects that assist seven other nations. For example, this summer, we helped with container shipping projects to assist friends in Ghana, Togo, and South Africa with education, agriculture, and sewing and clothing shops. But the main work that we do, if you would bring up that first slide, is to pick up and distribute food. Our warehouse is filled to overflowing. We have a saying, make space for God and he will fill it. He'll fill it and then we'll distribute it out to show Christ's love to people in need in a real and practical way. Our team is fantastic. We're volunteer driven. And one of the things that we do is a mobile outreach. If you look at the next few slides and you can go through them, the, the faces in our community of people that have needs. We partner with St. Elizabeth Hospital and Ludlow Vets to do last Saturday food outreaches to assist about 600 families just on the last Saturday alone. These are people that have different needs. They need food to get on to the next month and we're there to step in the gap. We rely on volunteers and we take in court ordered community service volunteers. And one of our special niches is special needs student volunteers. I'd like you to meet my friend, Andre. Andre is with Boone County Schools. And when the pandemic hit, all of us had to adjust how we operated. We couldn't take in large groups from the schools like we used to. So we focused on Andre. His goal was to get a job at a place like Lowe's. So we taught him over twice a week, four hours a day over an eight month period, how to do everything possible to operate a warehouse, to learn life skills. And Andre, at the end of his uh, end of his eight months with us, is equipped now to go out in to serve the community. And we couldn't do what we do without a strong board. I, special props to Monty Taylor. He's the membership development manager at the chamber. And I remember so well when he brought Jill Meyer down for a tour at Master Provisions to see the scope of what we do to help so many thousands of people every single week. And I remember for Jill, seeing was believing. And Monty, I think he's the number one ribbon cutter in greater Cincinnati. So thanks, Monty. Thanks, Jill. And I would like to close by saying, think about engaging with us. Be like Jill, come for a tour. Megan Jackson, our operator, or excuse me, our development director, she's our number one tour giver. She and I would be glad to show you what we do. Think about volunteering as an individual or a group. And with Giving Tuesday coming up, and we think about this season, Thanksgiving and Christmas, ways to give back. We encourage you to think about giving two master provisions where 95% of all donations go directly back into program support. I'll make sure and put our contact information in the chat. And we love serving in greater Cincinnati and our collaborative community. Thank you, Roger. I can tell you my family has participated in master provisions in Northern Kentucky. And the one thing I can tell you, the staff and the people and the recipients, their passion for life is just contagious. I wanna thank you, Roger, for your time today. For our last showcase, please welcome Lauren Waterbury from Cancer Bridge. Cancer Bridge is a cancer navigation resource for you and your family. 
Their goal is to make sure that all questions and concerns are addressed by world-class experts. They provide personal support programs focused on cancer prevention, education, and the importance of early detection. Should an employee receive a cancer diagnosis, they are there to guide and support them through their cancer experience. Cancer Bridge provides cost savings and cost avoidance through improved care, coordination, and access to experts and resources. Welcome, Lauren. Hello, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I have thoroughly enjoyed this briefing, and I feel so honored to be a part of such an incredible group of people and local businesses. Um, I'm Lauren Waterbury, your regional Cancer Bridge advocate, and I will be sharing information on our cancer care, support, and educational resource benefit offered to all employers and members of the Cincinnati Regional Chamber. Uh, cancer is a disease that has unfortunately touched so many of us, um, and through my personal experiences, I'm incredibly passionate about our service offerings. Um, cancer is one of the world's largest health problems. Um, one in three women and one in two men may face a cancer diagnosis um, in their lifetime. And with over 200 types of cancer and the complexity of the disease, it is essential to have personalized cancer support services. Um, cancer Bridge is a cancer focused navigation and information service for your employees and all of, their, all of your family members. Um, we provide immediate one-on-one -on -one personalized access to cancer experts who specialize in your employee's specific type of cancer. So we also provide educational resources on prevention, detection, early screening, and to help keep your employee's health a top priority. Um, so who we are, um, we are a benefit that is added to an employer's benefit package. Uh, we offer expert advice, so our oncology specialists listen and provide guidance regarding cancer questions and concern that might be for a patient or a caregiver. Employee education, we offer an incredible library resource of employee education opportunities related to cancer to promote health and wellness. And we also provide ongoing support, so our oncology certified nurses provide one-on-one -on -one support across the cancer care continuum through the entire cancer experience. Um, so what uh, your employee and their family may receive, um, through our service, they have access to certified oncology experts at National Cancer Institute, NCI designated comprehensive cancer centers, um, the one nearest you. And, um, the National Cancer Institute, NCI, is the highest federal rating a cancer center can achieve. It's the gold standard for cancer programs and is bestowed upon the nation's top cancer centers in recognition of their innovative research and leading edge treatments. We also provide, oh, can you go back? I'm sorry, Thomas. Um, immediate one-on-one -on -one personalized access to cancer experts who specialize in your specific type of cancer. So if you have um, an employee you know, who may have had their mother or father diagnosed, they are welcome to have that personalized access and can um, work one-on-one -on -one with our um, expert to understand and how to navigate their cancer journey. Um, and we provide ongoing support and answers during a time of crisis for not only the patient, but all, also their caregiver. Um, so what the employer receives, cost savings and cost avoidance through improved care coordination and access to cancer experts and resources. Uh, the ability to navigate employees and their families through the healthcare system efficiently and access to a variety of resources to help you educate your employees on cancer prevention, detection, treatment, and the latest research. Um, our pricing method, um, I just wanted to share this so that you know, you know that we offer this to small, medium, and large businesses. Um, and it is um, a reasonable knowing that the, the expert care and resources that your employees will have. And this is just an example I wanted to share because we really work with each employer um, and customize a program that suits their needs um, within their healthcare. Uh, spectrum. So this is something we did for November for Lung Cancer Awareness Month. It's a mailer that's going to all employees of a local organization. 
Um, and if you want to keep going to the next slide, um, we just gave information on um, lung cancer specifically because November is Lung Cancer Awareness Month. We went through prevention, um, screening guidelines, cancer risks. Um, so we worked closely with that employer on a specific program for them. So thank you very much. Um, I would love to be able to talk with you about our service and benefit um, for all of your employees. Um, it's an incredible resource and can help um, keep you know, your employees safe and provide the best care in a very hard situation. Um, I will put my, uh, my information in chat and if you need to reach me, you can find it there. I believe we all know of someone who could benefit from Cancer Bridge. Thank you, Lauren. I wanna thank these members for being part of our monthly member briefing. If you're interested in being part of future monthly member briefings, please go to cincinnatichamber.com slash monthly member briefings and submit an interest form. The Cincinnati Regional Chamber has a total of 10 benefit partners that enhance your business on an everyday basis. For our benefit partner, we are thrilled to have Ed Sawyer, Executive Vice President of Business Group Solutions. Ed is known as a master communicator, business builder, and business leader. BGR specializes in niche areas of incentives, credit services, and profit recovery. Today, Ed's gonna to share how your business could be entitled to a large cash incentive and credit programs offered through federal, state, and local levels. Ed and BGR do not want you to be one of nine out of 10 businesses missing out on unclaimed money for your business. They've helped more than 5,000 businesses claim these lucrative tax credits and incentives. Welcome, Ed. Thank you, Thomas and uh, Jill. And, and actually, we, we, we absolutely love uh, working with the chamber. I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and post my information quickly now. So, you, so if somebody wants to pick up my number or uh, send me an email, um, number one, what I think the most important thing is why why listen to what we have to say, <laughs> because because I, I don't blame you. <laughs> there's there's always things people say a lot. If, here's the bottom line: if you as a business paid taxes, your CPA has done all they could. To, to do everything they could for you, and, and from the corporate or from the uh, through the um, through, through the through the tax code, you need a you need a third party CPA group in order to help you get what is called tax credits. Those those come back to you in a very nice. They're large payments. They're tax free and not treated as income. It's free to find out how much and um, it, again, what AFTAB was, was even talking about is how we can help businesses, how we can help put, you know, put money back into our companies. That's all we do. We work with you. There is no obligation. Now, I'm going to have I've got a video that I'm going to have uh, Spencer go ahead and run for me, and I'll, I'll answer things after. Did you know that most small companies are leaving significant dollars on the table? It's because they aren't taking advantage of congressionally mandated tax credits and rebates that they are eligible for and probably don't even know exist. This may be happening to your company too. For example, in 1981, Congress enacted the Research and Development Tax Credit, which, according to recent IRS data, has since been expanded through several administrations. It was designed to help American businesses that are thinking bigger and better be more competitive and keep jobs within the USA and in their own local community. It's meant to reward companies who innovate, expand their business, and develop or improve existing products or services. According to the Washington Post, the R&D tax credit and other related tax incentives can save businesses more than $12 billion a year but the Wall Street Journal indicates that only 5% of small businesses are taking advantage of these tax credits and incentives. Unfortunately, the vast majority of eligible small companies are totally unaware of these benefits or how they may qualify for them. So, who does qualify? Doctors, dentists, manufacturers, construction companies, just to name a few. If you spend time being creative, developing a better product or service, so you can be more competitive, you likely qualify. And that's where we come in. 
We are Business Group Resources, and over the past 10 years, we have helped over 5,000 small businesses get back the money they deserve, just like the ones you see here. And we may be able to do the same for you. To see if you qualify for these congressionally mandated programs, contact us for a free analysis of the incentives and credits that may be available to you and your small business. Thank you. Next slide, Pastor, please. Um, now, what? Because those uh, those, those pieces were so small for you to see. Uh, these are these are just examples of some of the successes uh, we've had in the in the past year. Um, you can see dental offices, fifty one thousand. Uh, we got a steel manufacturing company, two million. Um, architecture firm, three hundred and fifty thousand. Uh, plastering contractor, twenty nine thousand. Um, and th this is all, this comes to you in tax-free dollars, not treated as income to your business because it's a repayment of tax. Uh, go to the next slide, please. Here's some, uh, also some in local uh, in, in the Cincinnati area. So just so you know, we're working all over the country um, and we can help where, wherever your com company is based. But if you're any connection from Cincinnati, it all comes back and we all participate and we all help the chamber. Just so you know, um, and that you can see we commercial construction company one uh, one point three million, an insurance company one hundred twenty five thousand, uh, computer so, computing solutions company thirty four thousand, uh, just on and on. Packaging manufacturer ninety two thousand. Um, next slide, please. Uh, these are the type of companies that that uh, qualify. We've helped. Uh, we've helped um, florists, we've helped architects, we've helped dentists. Um, anybody doing anything creative, they think they're doing just their standard business operation. Well, today, if you're improving your business, that is considered in today's world, the definition now is accepted as research and development. And most of you are doing that and constantly improving and constantly upgrading. The beautiful thing about these credits is once they are identified, they carry forward for 20 years until you use them up. And that's this is what we do. We educate people about it. We help you find the way to get them. Uh, next, next slide, please. Okay, uh, and, and probably people are thinking, okay, I don't have the books to back this up. I don't know where I'm gonna find this information. It's actually very simple. Um, we have a nine page uh, application. Five of them are questions of yes, no, with, with a, a brief explanation. The first thing we sign with you is a, an NDA. Uh, to make sure you know that you are pro, you're, you're completely protected uh, from a li any liability. We, we carry all the liability for your information. Um, it's a free analysis. There's no obligation in the process. You know how much you're going to get before you decide to move forward. And that's really important. Um, last, next slide, please. Uh, this is my contact. If, if anybody has any questions at this point, um, you're, you're welcome to th put them in chat if you'd like, or uh, again, go to the chat window, look, look at my information, Please feel free. My partner, Tom Santon, uh, and I love the city of Cincinnati, and we do all we can to help in any way, shape, or form that we can do it. And we're happy to help your business become stronger and in, in this time. And you can do this, oh, by the way, you, you look back three years the first time, and you can do it every year moving forward. That's it. Thank you for your time. I encourage you all to reach out to Ed. As he stated, there's no risk in a free analysis. Ed, thank you and your team for your partnership. I do have three quick announcements. The first one is by now, you should have received your re renewal notice for 2022. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me. I'm more than happy to help you navigate the process. Number two, we have an event on November 10th from 8 a.m. to 9 a.m. It is a webinar with 
Humana Chamber Health and Wellness Program Go365. This will be virtual and you can register at our website. And thirdly, we have Membership Benefits 101. It's back and it's in person. On November 16th at Infantech in Blue Ash, Again, you can find more information on the website from 8.30 to 10 a.m. You can learn how to maximize your membership ROI. We look forward to seeing everybody at these events. I wanna thank you for spending the morning with us and a big thank you to Bank of America for sponsoring today's great events. Mark your calendars to join us December 2nd at 8 a.m. for our next member briefing. Thank you.